Good morning, everyone. Good morning to President Crew, our faculty, staff, our students, um, our esteemed guests, and the Mega Evers College community. Welcome you to the college and to our panel called uh, Creating a New Social Justice Movement. Mega Evers College was founded out of the turbulence of the 1960s. If you fast forward about 50 years to today, we've witnessed uh, Nazis marching through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, um, protesting or, or, or um, Articulating the concerns about Confederate flags and Confederate um, monuments being torn down. We have witnessed NFL players come under attack for their social justice movements and for protesting um, the issues related to African Americans and our causes. And we're now witnessing women and the issues of sexual harassment being in the, in the media and the news every single day. So this is a concern of all of ours, and that's one of the reasons for this, this conversation today. I'd like to introduce... Tony Williams, who is going to moderate this conversation. Tony is not new to the college. She's a friend of ours. She is the director of corporate affairs for Con Edison, and she's been a supporter of the college for the last decade or more. Tony is also the executive director, executive producer, I should say, of Brooklyn Savvy, and she's the creator of the show. Um, thanks so much. Thank you so much. And it's just a pleasure to be here in Member Edwards College and being a part of what I think is a really important conversation. Today we're going to be talking about the state of social justice and its impact on the students here, you know, and the impact just broadly speaking. But before we do that, I'm going to introduce our panel. And I think, of course, Dr. Rudy Kuhn needs no introduction. As he somewhat about Dr. Cruz, had a 30-year career as an educator, which has included serving as a chancellor of the New York City school system and the superintendent of Miami schools. Dr. Cruz is a renowned leader and reformer who has made it his mission to include student achievement, especially for poor and minority students. He is the architect of the Metro Everest College Pipeline, where students from Central Brooklyn are guided through a strong K-12 experience, transitioned into college, and then provided high-quality opportunities to enter the professional world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rudolph Kerr. And on my left is Yasmin Giannis. Now, Yasmin, you are the organizing fellow for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, an organization founded by the great, wonderful place. We are at home, please be relaxed. <laughs> founded by Black immigrants and Black Americans to advocate for Black immigrant rights. You were previously worked as a senior associate at Human Rights Watch on U.S. foreign policy and refugee rights. She is a master's student at Union Theological Seminary in New York City studying racial and social ethics. She is a writer and activist whose work is informed by her understanding of social justice issues as a black immigrant Muslim woman. Ladies and gentlemen, Yasmin. Yes, and to my immediate right is Rabbi Michael Lerner, and he is the editor of Tikkun Magazine. with Beit Tikkun Synagogue without walls in San Francisco and Berkeley, California. He was chosen by Muhammad Ali to give a talk at Ali's funeral. Uh, all right, was a leader in the anti-war movement and was sent to prison by the Nixon White House. He became a psychotherapist who studied the psychodynamics of American society and why people were moving to the right even though their economic interests would have led them to support the left. So you are a, a tremendous author, but again, let us just give her another round of applause for Rabbi. And last but not least is Lorraine Daniel Favors. Now she is an activist. General counsel at the Center for Law and Social Just Justice here at Medgar Evers College. Before graduating from NYU Law School as a Ruth Tilden Kern Public Interest Scholar, 
Ms. Daniels founded Sankofa Community Empowerment, a nonprofit organization designed to empower racially disenfranchised communities. She later co founded Breaking the Cycle Consulting Services, which specializes in creating comprehensive professional development for educators, youth, education programs, and family workshops designed to address the crisis in urban education. Uh, I, I kind of like the author part, <laughs> where she was a contributing author to Birth of a Nation, Nat Turner, and the Making of the Movement. And she also wrote Afro State of Mind, Memories of a Nappy-Headed Black Girl. Uh, a story about a black girl fighting to find her place in the world with her hair texture and her color. But she's beautiful. As is Yami Kazmi, and as is everyone here in this audience today. So to get ourselves started, I would like us to, and I'm going to put this question to you, Dr. Cruz. Could you talk to us about what social justice is and how it's impacting these students here at Medford? Because when I think of social justice, it's starting to sound a lot like love. Everybody has their definition of what it means. So if you could kick us off by talking about that. Um, now can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here at the college. Um, and it couldn't be a more um, appropriate time and maybe even more appropriate question. Um, you know, I, I would tell you social justice, in my mind, really reflects um, the attitudes, the behaviors, the policies, and the uh, sort of contingencies about living that enable people to live fruitful and engaged lives. And when people are accorded that, they generally are accorded it, in, in our case, uh, under constitutional law. Uh, but we're also accorded it by virtue of human interaction and assumptions and a sense of, uh, of inclusion. What, what we are trying to do here in the college is we are trying to actually create a culture in the college that is distinct from the culture outside the college. It is about being able to say to people, the assumption we make of you is different than the assumption about your educability outside of you. We believe you're brilliant. We believe you can do anything that is put before you cognitively. We understand that there have been challenges in your life that have in many cases left you impoverished. But impoverished today does not mean impoverished tomorrow. Absolutely. So we believe that the mission of the college, from the civil rights era straight through now, is a mission to intercede uh, in the trajectory of bad assumptions, of negativity, of dispossession, in which young people find themselves in a larger context, having to now bring them, their own psychological selves, into a place where we actually dare to say and act differently than the larger society has acted towards them. So it's the distribution of that justice, human to human, person to person, faculty member to teacher, I mean faculty member to student, student to student, young student to uh, student in, 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 uh, in elementary school, um, parent to college. All of those interactions are places where social justice really means the human transaction that enables you to feel whole. I've been involved in struggles for social justice and economic justice, political justice uh, for a long, long time. I was born in 1943, and between 1940 and 1945, one out of every three Jews alive on this planet was murdered. Okay, one out of every three Jews alive on the planet was murdered. Um, for me, that was a shaping event in my childhood. My, my, a good part of my family was wiped out in, uh, as part of that in uh, Europe. And uh, so it was really um, not much of a leap 
to to then identify with the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s and feel that this was my movement as well as uh, and uh, and to come I came to understand very early that there is no such thing as social justice for one group that doesn't include social justice for all groups. And there's, there's no liberation that's possible without a universal liberation. And uh, so right now I've been, you know, at, when I spoke at Muhammad Ali's funeral, one of the things I emphasized was why we Jews want to stand very strongly in solidarity with, uh, with African Americans on the one hand and with all Muslims on the other hand. Because right now, those are two groups that are, one, for a long time, African Americans, being uh, uh, screwed over by this society and by this system. And, um, but also now um, using uh, fear of Muslims as another way to justify um, what is, in my view, a largely oppressive social order, economic and political order, that we live in today. So, um, I'm... I, I don't have another social justice definition. I want to say that um, that the struggle for social and economic and political justice is one that is intrinsic to what it is to be a human being. And I believe that everyone on this planet yearns for a different world, a world of love and kindness and generosity. And we have to, um, but most people, when you talk to them about it, will say, unrealistic, it will never happen, so i got to get on with my life. And Part of the, the struggle for social justice has to be to help people overcome the messages that they've gotten from the society that tell them nothing fundamental can be changed, because a lot can be changed and must be changed. Well, you know, very interesting answer. And, you know, here we are in Crown Heights, and we have a robust Afro-Korean community, and we have a robust uh, Hasidic community. I'm hearing what you're saying. How would you begin to bring us together? Because I live in Crown Heights. And I can't, I have some Jewish friends, but we don't talk to each other so much. So how do we move past that? This just kind of came out of my mind because I'm just sitting here listening to everything that you said, which was very inspiring. So what would you, what would you suggest that we would do so that we can bring these communities together in a time when we actually need each other very much, mm -hmm. especially when we think about Charlottesville. Well, I, I think I saw before, Rabbi Ephraim Mintz, are you still here? Rabbi Mintz, are you here? Um, okay. Uh, he was, he's the head of the Jewish Leadership Learning uh, Institute a few blocks from here. I believe that there's a great deal of openness there and that the, the, the way to bring that together is to bring it together. Invite people. Invite people here. You've invited me, uh, and I live in California. So uh, there are people four, four or five block, blocks away. Um, there are people there who are filled with love, um, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. And I think that um, um, invite them. Bring, bring them here. They don't know, and they don't know that you're open to it. And if they knew that you were open to it, I know that they would, many of them would embrace it, and I'd be happy to give anybody who wants some contact people there to, to do that. And they are the, they are the um, that is the, the, uh, the Lubavitcher Hasidic community is very, very much wants to have good relationships and real relationships. Good relationships isn't just getting the leadership of the communities to, to make nice. It's get to real, real conversations about the real, uh, real issues. And frankly, a central issue has to be for African Americans the way in which the African American community as a whole in the United States is economically oppressed and needs to be, and that needs to be changed. And uh, Jews should be involved in that struggle and will be involved in that struggle if invited in as opposed to pushed out. We're talking about a social justice movement. We define what social justice is. So how do we activate our voices? Now we've seen what's happened to Colin Kaepernick, and you know there may be those who might not want to pay the price that he's currently paying for lifting his voice. So how would how would you go about uh, activating those who are impressed to understand that they have a voice and to use that voice? 
Um, I think that's a really good question, especially right now, right? Because we are all essentially actors in a system of oppression where we have the opportunity to make certain sacrifices, to make certain uh, contributions to the struggle for our overall freedom. Um, but when you are particularly oppressed in society, it's important to just have a fundamental understanding about how power is shifted in your community, right? So one of the things I like to do is power mapping with people who are a part of groups that have less power. Identify who are the powerful stakeholders in your community. Who are the people who have access, access to the money? Who has access to the decision making? Who has access to the rooms, the private rooms where most of us would not be allowed in? Uh, where they're going to be making some fundamental decisions about the quality of our life. And then once we know who's got the power, we need to assess what strengths do we, that group that's identified as the oppressed group, what do we have? What is our power? What do we control that no one else controls? What are we really good at? What are our best things that we can bring to this table? Because we all have gifts, skills, and talents. The question is, how do we marshal them in a way that's going to be effective in this battle for power? Once you know who's got power and you know what power you possess, then you can strategize. And I feel like for a lot of people, some of the frustration comes in, um, how we choose to exercise what power we do have. So for example, an incident takes place, um, perhaps there's an officer involved shooting of an, of an African descendant person, and so we protest. And by protest, we go down, we have marches, we, we stand outside, we yell, we scream, we, we get engaged in a way that perhaps, for some of us, we may not have done before. But after the protest, there has to be a longer term conversation about what we do with that energy and how we take that for the long haul. And a lot of times people say, oh, I'm not protesting anymore, protesting don't work. No, protesting is very, very important. But protesting as a part of a long term strategy can be empowering as opposed to just feeling like, well, I protested and nothing changed, right? When President Barack Obama got into office, one of a lot of my colleagues would say things like, well, now we're going to deal with criminal justice, you know, we're going to free all the political prisoners. I'm like, mm, maybe. Right, but President Obama is a part of the federal system. Most of our political prisoners are in state criminal justice systems. Those are two different systems of power. If you're aiming all your frustration at the feds, not realizing that the people who got our people is the state, you're exerting a lot of energy, you're exerting a lot of passion, but you're not moving a power dynamic in that way. So we have to be students of the systems that we operate in. You know, I have a lot of my colleagues and my mentees who are like, you know, Miss, I'm not voting, I'm not engaged, I'm not doing this any other. But you I know what? I cannot stand the fact that people I actually do. think that they are powerful because they vote. Yeah. Right. But the challenge is, if you don't understand how to use the vote, you don't know the power that's there or not when you're not present. So if you don't, and I tell people all the time, if you are creating an independent system that is going to funnel resources, educate your children, heal your people when they're sick, provide housing and shelter, then maybe you don't need to vote. Maybe you can have your own independent country. I'm cool with that. But if you are in this society, you have to at least know what a vote does, how it's played, because my white brothers and sisters, when they have an issue and, and they're young, they hear mom say something about an issue and dad says, well, did you write the city council person? You know, I'm gonna write him a letter, then I'm gonna get my friend Jen and we're gonna go down to the city councilman's office and we're gonna have a meeting. But they're talking about how to use not just the, elect, the voting booth power, but civic engagement to move resources in a way that's gonna answer the problems that they have. So when you don't know that, you don't know the power of the vote. No, but what you said is so important anywhere in life. Yes. Because even if you work for a corporation, you need to know where the power of right. vote are. And you exactly. need to have a strategy. I wish you could have written all that down because there were a lot of tactics. So can people find, where can people find all these tactics that you laid out so quickly and so eloquently? Where can we find that information? I'm so glad you asked. So at the Center for Law and Social Justice. <laughs> resources that people can access. We have the Center for Law and Social Justice. We've got the Boys Bunch, and I don't even want to start naming names because I'm going to forget one. But I will say, there are spaces here on campus that people can be accessing. School of Professional Community Development has a ton of community resources that is funneling people out? to the school. Reach out? We reach out, we take reach in, we are here, We are, and I'm not even going to speak for the other departments, but there are places here at this campus that are addressing some of these issues. We're going to we're providing a mini voting course that we're offering to professors. Professors, check your email. We're offering to professors, and we can go around and explain why it is that we have this awkward relationship to voting and power. So it's here. But you know, as, as Dr. Pooh mentioned too, you all are changing a culture. You know, of course we want that. You, we want people to leave here, missionaries and disciples. You know, so that they, when they go out into the world, they are armed and ready to do the battle, so to speak, on the social justice front. Now, Yasmin, you have such a compelling story. I'd like for you to share your stories with this audience. And then we'll speak further. 
that we spoke about in the agreement around some of these issues. How are we going to inspire that? I think that it's always important when we're talking about these issues and working around them and learning that we always end in hope because it can be very easy to start getting feeling despair. And especially as most of us are people of faith, if you believe in God, if you believe in anything larger than ourselves, you have to believe there's a plan. You have to believe in hope and joy. And so I, I think I think that yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as we've learned, you know, we look at our history, global history, a global black history, um, working across the aisles with other folks. You know, anything that liberates black people who are at the very bottom of the caste system liberates all people, especially black women, right? Poor black women, especially. And so looking at um, the, the people who came before us and the victories that they did, right? We're looking at Malcolm, we're looking at the Black Panthers, we're looking about so many unknown black women who, who you know, many people don't know Rosa Parks was someone who advocated for sexual violence, you know, advocated against sexual violence. And so once we know our histories, we feel empowered. Exactly. So, Rabbi Learning, not to cut you off, but I want to add to what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, actually, I'm the editor of this magazine, Tikkun, and I think I'll pass around a few copies. Take a look at it and pass, pass it back to other people. Um, and Tikkun started an organization recently called the Network of Spiritual Progressives. And um, our central goal is the following. We want to um, advocate for, and get everybody else to advocate for, a new bottom line in the society. See, right now, every institution, every social practice, every corporation, every government policy is judged efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize money and power. And we're saying, no, we want a new bottom line that says that institutions, corporations, government policies, our educational system, our healthcare system, our judicial system should be judged efficient, rational, and productive to the extent that they maximize love and caring, kindness and generosity, ethical and environmental sensitivity, our capacity to see other human beings as embodiments of the sacred, and our capacity to see um, the, the universe, not from the standpoint of, gee, I wonder if there's something on this earth I can turn into a commodity and sell, but rather to see the universe from the, from the standpoint of awe and wonder at the grandeur and mystery of this universe. That's a new bottom line. And with that new bottom line, we could very quickly see that every institution Every government policy, or almost every government policy, is irrational, inefficient, uh, not what we should be uh, uh, supporting. Now, the na natural response to that is, but that's so unrealistic. You know, that'll never happen, right? Um, and that's exactly what has been used in every generation to tell anybody who wanted any change. Uh, we saw that with this, at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, when the, the, the first people who were out there, um, Rosa Parks, etc., and were out there fighting everybody around them, including fellow, you know, other people in their in their oppressed community, were saying it won't happen. Forget it. They were uh, they were nixing uh, um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. His fellow his uh, his fellow um, clergymen were saying African American clergymen, don't push too far. It's not going to happen. The same thing has ha happened in, in regard to almost the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, the struggle that uh, gays and lesbians have gone through in order to get gay marriage in some of the st states. Everybody said, impossible, it'll never happen. So if one short message, don't be realistic. <laughs> Do not be realistic, because you'll never know what is possible until you are engaged in a struggle over a long time period for what is desirable. So you feel that white privilege is something that we can get past, is what you're saying. Yeah, and I don't, <clears throat> and I think one way to do that is to, um, to on the one hand, see the racism in the society, but on the other hand, to not make all white people bad. To not make, because, um, you know, um, when Martin Luther King uh, Jr. spoke, I said two things about his spe speeches. Number, number one, he always said, blacks and whites together. And in the speech that I first heard him when I was in Washington at the, the, uh, in, in 1963 at the March on Washington, he got up and gave a speech and he didn't say, I have a 
complaint. Said, I have a dream. Articulate the dream. Go for your highest vision of the good. And, and you will find that there are many white people who want to really be with you and on your side. But they will not be with you and on, their so on your side if you are continually making them feel like they're bad. And, um, and if you do that, you push a certain section of them over to the right. And that has been a disaster. It's not a good thing to do. Find, find ways to recognize that most white people are born into the system. They didn't create it any more than you created it. And, and although they benefit from it in very various ways, they also suffer from it in various ways. So it's not a good system for anybody. It's, it's worse for African Americans, but it's not good for the vast majority of the 80% of Americans whose, um, whose income is uh, less than the top 1% of, uh, of the wealthy white. So much goodness. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know how you're in the space and you're getting full from everything that everyone shares. This is very full for me. Um, I fundamentally believe in the principle of Sankofa, which is a West African Ghanaian principle, which essentially for the American translation is, is you got to know where you came from in order to understand where you are. right? And so um, Neely Fuller Jr. has this quote, if you don't understand white supremacy, what it is, how it operates, then everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. So when I think about having hope, right? And I think about some of the, the ancestral legacies that we draw from. As it pertains to hope first, I had to carry my ancestral story with me everywhere that I go. When I was in corporate law, I had to carry my answer. I would pour libation in my office. I would call on the name, uh, seriously, because I need that spiritual power. Because if I know what Harriet Tubman had to navigate, and the first time she goes back home, the first person she goes to get is her beloved, and he is already beloved with someone else, but then she goes back 19 additional times to get other people, that's a revolutionary type of love that can help me accomplish anything. But if we don't know that story, if you're waiting for the K-12 institution to teach it, if you're not reaching out and learning that information you're never going to get it so you will fundamentally feel mismatched you will fundamentally feel like you don't belong and you'll believe those outside rumors that people have about us and so i think it's important that we're aware of that and as it pertains to how we get there together one of the things that I always have to recall, and this is particularly pertinent because we're in a time right now where there's heightened conversation about assault, sexual assault in particular a person who has been victimized by by a rape or by a sexual assault has to be able to come to a space of healing regardless of whether or not the person who assaulted her apologizes, is ever jailed, or hit, assaulted her or him. I don't want to be gender neutral here. There has to be a healing that that victim can attain regardless of what happens with the person who committed the assault. African descendant people, we have to be able to create a liberation vision for our people that allows our fullness and our humanity to be completely manifest. And it would be great I would love it if our white brothers and sisters would get there with us. If they don't, and we have to consider in this time of open and, and revived white supremacy and honesty about how white supremacist people are really trying to be there, trying to out white supremacy each other. In this moment, <laughs> we have to, yeah, yes. In this moment, we have to consider what I think our ancestors, going back to history, had to consider at the end of Reconstruction. You had 12 quick years of Reconstruction at the end of slavery. And then white supremacy said, okay, we're done. We're done with enforcing laws to protect black people. We're done with this pretend pseudo, we are the world thing that you all have. We're done. And African descent of people at that moment had some real tough decisions to make. We've had integration for approximately 52 years since the 1965 Voting Rights Act. It's been very, very brief. It lasted about three times as long as Reconstruction. I feel like it's been a very beneficial thing for me. I think it's been beneficial for many of us. But we're at a point now in our nation where there are some decisions being made about how committed our society is to this ad, this we are the world and vision, uh, a vision that that dream was talking about. And so we have to recognize that yes, we want to get there together, but our humanity requires us that we get there regardless. And so we have to have a commitment amongst ourselves that we're going to love each other more than white supremacy talks to each other. Right? Which means that we're going to work the face of art, the person who makes us angry looks like us, and you are confirming every negative stereotype I have been told about black people. Like, I'm gonna have, my Harriet Tubman love is gonna move me past that frustration. I'm gonna work with you anyway. I'm gonna commit with you anyway, because my life depends on your life being successful. So I think we have to have a, a doctor and patient approach so that we can have room for this collaborative liberation space, knowing that our bottom line is we're gonna be whole at the end of it. And Yeah. Oh, we have uh, issues right now.
now when it comes to fake news, alternative facts. Young people go onto YouTube and, and the internet and social media to really understand what issues are. How are you educating students on how to consume the media? Because so much of how we think and feel about ourselves is informed by what we're seeing and hearing on the outside. And you have to be an aware person to be able to confront that. Um, you know, it's, it's less just what we do in college, it's more what we do in Brooklyn, um, specifically, um, arguably not in Washington, the city, but this is where this notion, this is where this notion of critical thinking comes into play. So schooling is the ability to create leverage whereby people can actually use new knowledge to create new settings. Right? People will create settings that make sense for their world to the extent that they have, if your word was liberation, to the extent that they have the freedom to do that. Their instinct is always to do it in a way that's better, that advances their own interests, etc. My, my biggest worry about this fake news conversation in today's parlance and in, and in the world here in the college is that people actually are, are, are sort of numb right now to what really is news, right? So somebody got shot. That's almost not news anymore. Somebody, uh, somebody will come forward with statistics um, uh, about the number of students who are, or the number of young people that are dropping out of school or not attaining a college degree or not attaining a high school. It's almost not news. We've become numb to the conditions of our lives. Uh, part of what I distinguish fake news from real news is what does it do to your own sense of self? Right? It's, it's, it's the barometer isn't what, the, what channel do you turn to, but it's what part of your own interior in life is enlivened because you now have that information or you have that news, right? I worry, to be perfectly honest with you, that we don't pay enough attention to young people um, creating enough knowledge about how to distill real news about them versus the news about the world, right? They, in many cases, do not see themselves as a part of the bigger world. So they don't really know what you just said a minute ago and, frankly, what Rabbi said earlier. There are too many students, some of whom are right here, who get so caught, they get wrapped around the day-to-day -day axle of my tuition, my, 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 my grade, uh, my professor, uh, my money for lunch, um, all of which is important. I'm not suggesting to you none of these things are important, especially when it comes time you all pay tuition. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, it's that myopic view of their lives that begins to be the substitute or the proxy for living. And what we want to try to do is to create a vision in which young people see themselves as owners of the vision of their life. That's very different than just simply going to school to get a grade. I'm not suggesting to you that going to school to get a grade is not important. Don't ever hear me say that. Right? But I'm saying to you, there's an end game here that's way bigger than whatever the grade is you get. So when you hear me talk, and I get an opportunity to, to, to get face to face with you, it is always about, listen, here's where we are right now. The, the your human map has you right here at 1650 Bedford. But the map I see in you, the map for you, is yet to be lived out. But I can tell you what that map takes you to, especially if you learn what's happening up here, what's happening in your classes, what you feel and what you sense and what you're able to distill out of this BS news that is always going to tell you that you're crazy. This news is always going to have black folks looking, sounding, or being pictured as not having common sense to even be able to figure out your world. Whether I, and I lived in L.A. just like you do now, I presume, Rabbi, right? or Berkeley. Okay, I got a daughter in Berkeley. Well, regardless of where it is in this country that we have all been, the, the country is completely transfixed by this notion 
that there are some people who are good enough, bright enough, and capable enough, and then, there, then there's everybody else. And what happens is, if you drink that Kool-Aid, and you buy the notion, as perpetrated by fake news, you buy the notion that you're in the everybody else category, whether you are black, white, poor, uh, whether your first language is English or not. See, this is what I'm saying. We can't get caught fighting each other over who's the most undeserving. This has really got to be about us saying to us, you know what? You And I always say it as you were a child of God when you were born. Right? That's all you need to know. Now everything else comes second to that. What grade you got in XYZ professor's class, that's second to that. What your president says to you about what your capabilities are, whether it's me or anybody else, that's second to that. It's what you tell yourself about your capabilities. That's the part that we want to influence. And we don't want the outside world, fake news crazy world, to start telling you, well, you're only capable of an F, or only capable of some mediocre benchmark, or you're only capable of entering school, but we're not sure you're gonna graduate from school, or you're only capable of being able to go to jail because Yale is really not your option, right? So the more you buy that Kool-Aid, the more you will actually, without you even knowing it, you'll actually begin to act, act like that. And our hope is here at the college that your ability to distinguish fake news from your own personal news will be the guiding post for you de determining where your, your map takes you. That's, that's way more I important. Think we need a round of applause for that. time for people who run institutions like, like this or any others. Um, yeah, they, they're, they're going to have to pay a lot of money to be able to provide the security for this, and that money, I presume, uh, has to come out of the coffers of the college, which theoretically, at least, they could do a whole lot of other things that have to do with the redistribution <laughs> of services to young know, people so that they get the kind of education that they need. It's all done under the auspices of Constitution. The Constitution allows for it, so you, can't, you cannot step on that. But what you can do is essentially a little bit of the, the sort of play judo with, with the way that this works. So what you can do is start actually charging a surf, surcharge of some sort for people who, who want to go to that. So if you really want to go, let's build the cost of security into the actual cost of city to go. So you are now asking people to pay, you know, $1,200, $1,500, 1800 uh, as, a, as a way of being able to go. Now, I understand what they've done um, in Florida is they've essentially said we're going to uh, try to min minimize the crowds and therefore minimize the uh, amount of potential um, uh, disruption that this all causes. It, 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 no matter what it is, the leadership of this era is a leadership that now has to be as bold as the 60s leadership was yes. in the creation of its settings in which people literally use their job as shields against the tyranny of the day to day, right? So you kidding? I, I, you know, nobody's ever come here and asked, you know, and, and it'd be crazy to do. But it, there's nobody that's ever like that that's ever come or or, or, or or asked to come here. But if they did, but if they did, right? There would be a Megar Evers moment in which all of us as leaders, regardless of what our job day to day is, our own take your own common sense mother wit self to work that day, and you would all have to, in effect, take a knee. Because you can't, you can't be about social justice at the same time as giving court harbor to this mania. You can't do both. Now, I understand the Constitution. I understand, 
I should say honestly, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm, not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm trying to get myself out of a little bit of trouble right now with the little, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but I, but I, but I understand. I understand what it means to fight. And you have to be prepared, in today's leadership parlance, you have to be prepared to give up the job the day they give it to you. Because the conversation you're gonna to have to have is a conversation that says, you young people, your lives are only going to be as good as I use my life and yours and yours and yours and yours to actually provide a road for you to actually move on. The same way as Stokely, H. Rapp, Martin, Robert, all of them did for us to be able to be in the jobs we got to for today. So you're standing on these shoulders and you now have to pay it forward. All I'm saying to you is, you, you, it, 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 this is why when Rabbi was talking, I was thinking, boy, I do hope that this world comes about soon because I'm running out of time. But, but, I, but in my heart, in my heart, my worry is there are not enough warriors. There are people who are. There, there are a lot of people who know how to fake the funk. There are a lot of people who got their, got their car, got their job, got their plaque on the door, got the degree, got everything that they need. And then they literally forget, and I see it every day here, to reach back and grab four or five hands and bring them forward. So I, I'm just saying to you, fake news is not as much as, much is not as important to me as the real news. The real news is, who did you bring forward in the time you had on this earth? Conversation for questions. Does anyone have quite a question that they would like to ask of the panel? There's one. Yes, yeah. There, there, there. Yes. Yeah, I had a question for. Um, I forgot the gentleman's name right here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, speaking about um, bringing uh, white folks into the movement that we want to um, help. Um, I've known that uh, for a long time, black people have already known, particularly in America, that we're all in this together. Um, we were left out of the New Deal, we were left out of the labor movement, and all these things did was weaken um, the labor movement as a whole. Now, we always knew this. Um, however, I feel like the white folks that are poor that would have the same in common don't. And I feel as though because of us consistently being left out of these things, I feel as though it's the job of progressive whites to let other white folks know, particularly poor white folks know, the white privilege is just a veil that's actually weakening them. Right here in this neighborhood, we had a white flight, you know, um, because they believed the myth that we would bring down their values, their own values. So isn't that the job of other white progressives to do that and not ours? Yes and no. Um, it's funny because um, <clears throat> I've had I, I've been an, an organizer for many years trying to build movements, and on the one hand, um, when um, when we've tried to do that, when I've tried to to build a movement of white people to talk to other white people, I get denounced as as saying, "Hey, your movement doesn't have any black people here. What's wrong with you?" Right? Then if, we, then if we bring black people in, they say, no, why, is it, why don't you do it by yourself? So we get dub, double messages, you know? I mean, I, one of the things, I, uh, one of the reasons I'm passing around Tikkun is I'd like to invite everybody here to write for Tikkun, to write about your experience. Not, you, know, you don't have to be a college professor to write, write for us. We have a website that gets to many, many, many tens of thousands of people who read it. I want you to educate those people. Okay, but um, but at the same time, I'm saying, as I said at the beginning, um, yes, we have a big job to do to try to educate white people about the way in which white supremacy is not a privilege. It's actually something that keeps them in a subordinate state, 
and keeps, keeps, them, keeps most white people relatively powerless. It's not a good thing for them. But um, I want to do that in education. Um, and it's not helpful when um, in social movements where people are working, they're suddenly told, you're a white person, you're a man, and you, are, um, and you have all this privilege. And you, because so many of the people that, that we work with, I work with um, the, uh, the labor movement in our area, just a little correction on that, the black African Americans play a critical role in building the American labor movement, you know? Um, the, uh, it was uh, originally the, um, the Pullman strike, Pull, you know? Is, but exactly, it fell Randolph. It, uh, don't underestimate the important role that they played in that, in that movement. Uh, not getting enough credit for it, for sure, but really being in, uh, critically involved and being the, often the most courageous people in those struggles. What I want to say to you is, hey, listen, I'm here asking you, hey, subscribe to Tikkun. Can't afford it? We'll give it to you for free. Well, you have to write to me, okay? Rabbi Lerner. R-A-B-B-I-L-E-R-N-E-R -E -E dot Tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N, and, uh, and you want to join our network of spiritual progressives, can't afford it, I'll, you can go for free. I want you to be part of us. I want you to help us. I want you to give us direction and wis your wisdom and share it. Um, don't say that nobody ever invited you, okay? I'm inviting you, okay? I'm inviting you to be part of, of that movement. And we want your direction, your, your insights, and so forth about how to do it. But at the same time, don't put everybody down just because of the color of their skin. In this case, white. I'm sorry I was born with a penis. I'm really sorry. But, you know, I don't need to be oppressing women by virtue of that. <laughs> I don't need to be oppressing women because of that. And I don't want to be told that I am oppressing women just by virtue of the fact that I'm a man. Okay? So, let's... <laughs> Let's hold it universally. Don't put down people the color of their skin. Don't put down people because of their gender. Yes, there is real patriarchy. Yes, there is real um, male privilege in the society and white privilege in the society. But we want to whip people away from that, not push them further into it by telling them that's their fate because of their biology.